morning, everyone. It's time for us to begin. We'll begin this morning by singing number 62 in our song books, number 62. After this song, we'll have a reading and prayer. Number 62. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? This morning will be from Acts chapter 11, verses 26. It's a New American Standard Version. And when he had formed him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerably numbers. And the disciples were called Christians in Antioch. Would you please stand for the prayer? Pray with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you have provided for us. We thank you for the rain that has come upon us, watered our fields. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on all of those of the congregation who are not well, those who are recovering from surgery. We pray that you will allow them to recover completely and be with us soon. We ask your blessings on the speaker of the hour. We pray that he has a ready recollection of those things he has prepared and that we may listen with our hearts and our minds centered on eternity. Heavenly Father, we ask your convenient service for this nation. We pray that it will return to you and make your way known throughout the land. Now we'd ask that you would go with us, guard us, guide us, and protect us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior's name, amen. Number 347, 347.
Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders, ready to obey? Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways? Working for the Master, giving him the praise. Earnest in his vineyard, honoring his laws, faithful to his counsel, watchful for his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love, leading others to him, lifting prayers above, curving faithful servant in his word we sing, on our side forever will the Savior be. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. I see you, please. Turn books now to number 157. We'll sing this song in preparation for the Lord's Supper. 157. <laughs> Alas, and did my Savior bleed? Drops of 
As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 14 through 17. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise people, you then... Judge what I say, is the cup of blessing which we bless, not a sharing of the blood of Christ? Is the bread which we break, not a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Let's give thanks for the loaf. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to surround the table and partake of this memorial, looking back to that scene on the cross where Christ was willing to go and his body hang and broken there for us. As we partake of this this morning, Father, help us to visualize in on that, to give thanks for the sacrifice that was made and the love that was shown to us. We, we thank you now for this loaf. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue observing this memorial feast, this time partaking of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood Christ shed for us for the remission of our sins, we would pray that we all would understand why and partake of this in a Worthy manner, pleasing to you, in Christ's name. Amen.
concludes our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Another commandment that we are instructed to do on each Lord's Day is to lay by in store. And we'll take that opportunity to do that now. Greg, will you lead our thoughts for the gift and the giver? Thank you, Father, many blessings and bestow upon us as we go through this life. Especially, uh, thankful, Father, for your son. He got a terrible death and cross for our sins. Thankful, Father, for our families, our, our food, our homes. This time, Father, I would like to extend the gospel, the spreading of the gospel here and abroad. You know, Father, that you love a cheerful, a cheerful giver. Now, Christ in the pray. Books now to number 409. <clears throat> 409. Be aware that this is not the one we normally sing. The one we normally sing is on the opposite side of your book there. There's a slight difference in the wording in the third verse and and the tune is different. <coughs> Number 409. <coughs> the church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ her I appreciate so much the opportunity to be with you once again and to study from God's Word. The lesson this morning may seem a little 
unneeded uh, by some as we talk about a very simple question of who is a Christian. I had the importance of this particular uh, lesson impressed upon my mind a few years ago. I won't name the place, but I was in a gospel meeting and this, uh, in the home of some of the members there, and they were rejoicing over the fact that their son was about to get married. And so they were talking in regards to plans for the wedding and so forth, and talking about the young lady that uh, he was going to marry. And just for casual questions and conversation, I asked the question, Oh, is she a Christian? And their reply was, oh, yes, she is very much a devoted Christian. And I found out later that the young lady was a member of a denominational church near where they lived. But yet they were ready to affirm that this young lady uh, that he was about to marry was a Christian. And it made me realize that probably this uh, is the attitude of a lot of people. So this morning, I want us to discuss this particular question and look at the answers that are given by some. There are some people that would refer to uh, any good moral person as being a Christian. Well, what about this? You know, if you turn to the book of Acts, over in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, we're introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. And this uh, man was a centurion in the Roman army. And he is referred to as a devout man, a man that feared God, a man that gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. Now I think this is a description that all of us would be delighted to have made of us. A devout, God-fearing, benevolent, praying man. But you know what else he was? He was a lost man. If you just jump over one chapter where Peter is giving uh, a description of what took place as to what brought him to the household of Cornelius and how that Peter describes that Cornelius was instructed to send for Peter who would come and would tell him words whereby he and his house might be saved. Now let me tell you something, friends. Only lost people need to be saved. And so when Peter, I mean when Cornelius was instructed to send for Peter who would come and tell him words whereby he and his household might be saved, that was simply another way of saying here is a man that is lost that needs to be saved. He was not a Christian. And I'm convinced that all of us have known individuals in our lifetime who had many good moral qualities but never submitted their life in obedience to the gospel of Christ. They were not Christians. But probably the most accepted view among men is that a Christian is anyone who believes in Jesus. And as I say, I think this is probably the most accepted view among men in answer to the question, who is a Christian? Sometimes you turn on the news and you read over in foreign countries where there's great persecution against Christians. And yet many of those who are being persecuted, even though we're certainly opposed to that, 
are not Christians according to what the Bible teaches. How do I know that? Well, I think Jesus answers the question himself. There in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21, Jesus simply states that not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to say that many in that day were going to say something. They're going to say, Lord, Lord. Here they're calling upon Jesus as Lord. Did we not prophesy in thy name? Why, in thy name we've cast out demons. We've done all these wonderful works. You would think that Jesus would reply, Oh, I'm so thankful for that. I appreciate that. But note, if you note carefully, Jesus didn't say that. He said, Then I'll say to them, Depart from me. I never knew you. And how does Jesus describe these individuals? As workers of iniquity. Or you may be reading from a version that says workers of lawlessness. And that's exactly what that word means. They were workers of lawlessness. They were doing something without law or without authority. So they're saying, we're doing all these wonderful works. And Jesus is saying, I did not authorize it. And I think that's the situation that that we see in our nation today among the majority of people who would claim to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. They're teaching things that are without his authority. That was exactly the situation of this young lady that I just described a few moments ago. She was a part of a religious group, a a religious denomination that was teaching and practicing things that are not authorized in the word of God. Well, how do we answer the question, who is a Christian? We have to go to the scriptures themselves. And you would think that the way that the name Christian is thrown around and and mentioned by people today that in the New Testament, which is the uh, doctrine of Christ, that you would find it mentioned on nearly every page. But that's not the case. It is only found three times in the Scriptures. But I believe that we can look at these three passages and learn a great deal and not, and answer the question, who is a Christian. Note I say the question is who, not what. Who is a Christian? The first time that the name is found is in the passage that was read in your hearing just a few moments ago where the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We'll come back to that passage uh, in our study. But the second place that the name is found is in the 26th chapter of that same book of Acts where Paul is making his defense before a man by the name of Agrippa. And after making his defense, Agrippa's reply there in verse 28 is almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And I was looking through uh, different translations and I came across one that says, where Agrippa said, I am almost persuaded to be a Christian. And before we comment further upon that, let's look at the third instance. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, Peter is emphasizing that as uh, followers of Christ, we may have to suffer. And in the preceding verse, he had said, don't don't suffer as an evildoer. 
Sometimes you can suffer the wrong reason. You may be doing something that is wrong and, and, and suffer. As I'm convinced that many of the guys that uh, I was teaching uh, this past Tuesday night probably would agree with that particular statement. They, they had done something wrong and now they're in jail and they're suffering the consequences of the choice that they make. But in verse 16, Peter also notes that a, a person may suffer as a Christian, but if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Now, instead of going back to the first, let's just take a look at this passage here in 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. We learn from this that as a Christian, we glorify God in this name or in this manner or on this behalf, depending on which translation that you may be reading. But all of them recognize that the original has the idea of glorifying God in this name. Now, if I didn't learn anything else, about being a Christian, I would learn that in this name we glorify God and wearing any name other than or in addition to. The name Christian is without Bible authority. You go out here in the religious world and you ask somebody what they are religiously and you'll get various answers. I'm, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Lutheran. And you can go down the list of the various names that people would give. And they ask you, well, what are you? And you say, well, I'm a Christian. And oftentimes, you oh, well, oh, yeah, I am too. I, I, I'm. And so... Their idea of being a Christian is I can be a Christian, but I can also be a Baptist Christian, a Methodist Christian, a Lutheran Christian, a Presbyterian Christian, or any of the other denominations that have been established by men. But if I didn't learn anything else from this particular passage, I would learn that being a Christian is the name in which I glorify God and for me to wear any other name other than the name Christian would be without Bible authority whatsoever. Well, let us back up now to the 26th chapter of the book of Acts and see what I can learn from this particular passage. Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, if I didn't learn anything else from this particular statement, I would learn that a Christian is something I can be persuaded to become. This, again, is contrary to what is taught by many in the religious world. There are some who teach that God is the one that has to be persuaded. But the, as we study the word of God, we see that the persuasion is toward us. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we do what? We persuade men. And later on in that same chapter, down in verse 20, he refers to himself and the other apostles as ambassadors of Christ. And he says, as ambassadors of Christ, he says, we persuade men. How? By beseeching you, be ye reconciled unto God. There's a practice in the religious world that is known as the mourner's bench where people come to what they refer to as the mourner's bench and they plead with God or plead with Christ to come into their heart, trying to persuade God or Christ to save them. We don't have to do that. 
We're the ones that need to be per persuaded. We beseech you, Paul said, be ye reconciled unto God. How is it that we are persuaded to become Christians? The Apostle Paul, over in the first chapter of the book of Romans, said, I'm not ashamed of something. What is it? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why is it, Paul, that you're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Because it, that is the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. And for therein, he says in verse 17, is revealed what? The righteousness of God. What does it mean? That the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. It's not the fact that God is righteous. We know that's true. But that's not what Paul is talking about when he says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I think we find the answer to it later on in that same book of Romans. As Paul talks about his Jewish brethren, he says there in chapter 10 and verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is what? That they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but what? But not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, had sought to do what? To establish their own righteousness. Well, what's he talking about when he talks about God's righteousness? It's simply the means by which God counts man righteous. Or in the light of our lesson this morning, God's way of making one a Christian. And Paul said that that Righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel of Christ. And that's the power of God unto salvation. Let us never forget that. I may have mentioned this in a previous lesson. I, I tell people my memory is great. It's just not very long. But I held my first gospel meeting in probably about exactly this date in 1961. And I had an aunt that was attending that meeting. And those of us who, uh, those of you who are a little older can know that back in the early 60s, late 50s, we were battling the battle against institutionalism and churches become involved in the support of human organizations and institutions and activities that were without Bible authority. And I was talking about brethren thinking that fellowship meant social activities. I just made the comment that some brethren had gotten to the point that every time they heard the fellowship, they could smell the coffee and donuts and pointed out that that's not the fellowship that's taught in the Bible. After services, my aunt came to me and said, James, I'll never set foot inside another place where you're preaching. Some 40 years later, she went back on that but she said, I believe that if it takes coffee and donuts to save men's souls, then we need to use the coffee and donuts. And you know what I told her? I agree with you 100%. And I still do. If it takes coffee and donuts to save men's souls, Brendan, I have no idea how much money may be in your treasury. 
but I would encourage you to take every dime of it and buy every donut and every cup of coffee that you can get your hands on and distribute it. But you know what would happen if you did that? You'd have uh, people full of coffee and donuts. If we're concerned about the salvation of souls, we're going to have to use the only thing that will do it. And Paul said, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And that's what we need to use to persuade men. But now let's go back to that first passage that was read in our hearing in the beginning. In Acts 11 and verse 26, there are several terms that are used here in reference to the people identified as Christians. We see that they're referred to as the church, as disciples, and then as Christians. They assembled for a whole year that were assembled with the church and taught great many people, and the disciples were called, first called Christians in Antioch. So all three of these terms are used in reference to the people that are identified or that were called Christians. I remember hearing Brother Robert Turner many, many, many times talk about the use of the word church. And he said, when you hear the word church, you thank people. And so here the disciples. So... These are the ones that are called Christians. You know, there are some in the religious world who teach that this means that the people were called Christians in derision. Sort of like, you don't hear it as much anymore. But I can remember the time when oftentimes members of the body of Christ or Christians were referred to as Camelites with the accusation that we believe what we believe and do what we do because of Alexander Campbell. And so that was a term that was used in derision against those. That's not the idea in this particular passage where it says that the disciples were first called Christians and then the word that is translated called here is a word that is defined as to be called, to be admonished or warned of God. It is a divine calling to be called of God. Now, why would these individuals be called? Christians. This word's not found often in the scriptures. I call your attention to another passage where it is found in Romans 7 and verse 3. Here Paul talks about a woman that if she be joined to another man while her husband is yet living, he says she shall be called an adulteress. Now why would she be called an adulteress. Because that's what she is. And so going back to our passage in Acts 11, why would these disciples be called Christians? Because that's what they were. And going back to our point on 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, to be called or to wear any other proper name would be without authority. Yeah, the people were referred to as the church, but that's not a proper name. They're referred to as disciples. But again, that's not a proper name. But the proper name by which they were identified as the name Christian. And going back to 1 Peter 4, to wear any name 
other than or in addition to that name Christian is without Bible authority. But now, let's look at this other term that is used in reference to these people who were called Christians. The disciples were called Christians first and then. A disciple is a learner, a pupil, a follower of, and thus a disciple of, of Christ is one who is a follower of Christ, and those dis, uh, disciples, followers of Christ, were called Christians first at Antioch. In Matthew 11, we have that great invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn of me. That, that's a disciple. And one of my favorite passages as far as understanding who a disciple is is found in the 8th chapter of the book of John. You know, we often quote verse 32 of John 8 all by itself. And you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And as true as that statement is, we need to understand that that statement here is part of what began with the statement that Jesus makes in verse 31. As Jesus spoke to those Jews that believed on him, he said, if you abide in my word, then there are three things that will be true. Number one, if you abide in my word, then are you Truly, my disciples. And number two, you shall know the truth. And number three, the truth will make you free. But note, being his disciple, knowing the truth, and being made free by that truth, we're all dependent upon one thing. If you abide in my word. What does that mean? We stay within the Word of God. John, in writing in his second epistle, in Second John, whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ does not have God. But the individual who abides, that is, stays within the confines of God's Word, he has both the Father and the Son. Now, looking at what the scriptures say in these three verses, we learn that we can wear no other name and glorify God. We learn that being a Christian, that we're persuaded by the gospel of Christ to become such. We learn that being a Christian is a follower of Christ and one who abides in the teaching of Christ. And thus to take that name Christian and apply it to those who have rejected the authority of Christ, who are members of and promoters of religious organizations and groups, not found in the pages of God's Word. And even they admit that such is not in the teaching of Christ. Mr. Edward T. Hiscox wrote the Standard Manual for the Baptist Churches of America. I believe it's on page 21. He makes a statement that in apostolic times, what's that? In, in the times of the New Testament, in apostolic times, when there was but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and no different denominations. So even he admitted that there, in New Testament times, there were no, these den denominations did not exist. In my particular copy of that manual, 
out in the margin I've written in. As he, he says later on, now it is different. I, I write in who, who, who changed it. My Bible still reads in Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that's what we need to persuade people to do. To accept what the Bible says, accept what the Bible teaches. And don't, don't go referring to someone who rejects the teaching of Christ and follows the teaching and commandments of men and refer to that individual as a Christian. The Bible does not support such. So we need to ask the question, what must I do to be a Christian? Which is just another way of asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Because you remember there in Acts 11, it was the church that was assembled together and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In Acts 2, when those people heard and believed the preaching of, of Peter and believed that Jesus was Lord in Christ and said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And verse 47 of that same chapter says, And the Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved or such as should be saved. That's what the church is. Those who have been redeemed, those who are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And yes, following the teaching of the Apostle Paul, as he gave instructions to the young evangelist Timothy there in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the things that I hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit that of faithful men who should be able to teach others also. And what were they doing? They were seeking to persuade men and women to become Christians, just as Paul sought to persuade Agrippa to become a Christian. You remember Paul's response to Agrippa? When Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, Paul said, I would to God that not you only, but all those who hear me this day would be such as I am, except these bonds. And Paul was a prisoner. He didn't want that, but he was a Christian. And that he wished that all who heard him that day would become such. And so it is today. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then as we studied in our Bible class this morning, you demonstrate that faith by doing what Jesus said. You repent and you be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, you need to do it while there's yet time. But you know that same book that tells us how to become a Christian tells us that it's possible for someone who has done what he needs to do to become a Christian that he can sin afterwards. There in Acts 8, Simon, he believed he was baptized. That's what Jesus had said a person needed to do. But he sinned. He thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. And Peter rebuked him. And you said you need to repent. And pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart would be forgiven. If you need to obey his will, either in becoming a Christian or, or in making correction in your life as a Christian, let it be known right now as together we stand and sing the song that's been announced. Yeah.
to make this morning and afterwards we'll be dismissed with prayer. Good to have everyone here this morning. Have several of our number who are either sick or out of town and so we need to pray for their safe return and safe recovery from their ailments and invite everybody back again this evening at six o'clock. We'll meet for evening service. Brother Han will be bringing us the evening lesson and and uh, invite you back at that service. Also Wednesday evening at 7 30 for a midweek Bible study be doing the questions on the lesson on Abraham we talked about this morning on the sick list. Uh, Greg says his mother is doing better. Uh, she's getting so much better. She doesn't want to use her walker. So we're not really sure that's such a good idea, but at least uh, sounds like her attitude is good <laughs> and she physically is doing better. So we appreciate that very much. Uh, his dad's about the same, remains in the nursing facility, so keep the words in your prayers. Uh, and Polly has been having some health issues this week as well, so we need to remember her. Several are mentioned on the back of the bulletin that have chronic problems, and they, they come when they're able and, and um, need an interest in our prayers, so please look that over and uh, touch base with them. Send them a card, maybe a phone call or visit and uh, keep them in your prayers. Out of town today, Adam and Kara are out of town, and the Metcalfs are out of town also, so you need to keep them in mind. Uh, there are several summer series going on this month in the area. Westside in Salem, I believe, is having one that starts tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, uh, sort of a vacation Bible school gospel meeting combination, I suspect. So their services are at 7 uh, Expressway is having a vacation Bible school the 18th through the 21st, and on the 19th through the 21st, they'll have evening services. So, uh, if you care to attend Expressway, those are the dates and the times. And then Hebron Lane is also having a summer series the 16th through the 18th, and the first two nights are Friday and Saturday. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday series. They are meeting at 7:30, so keep that in mind. There are flyers on all three of those posted on the bulletin board to your right as you leave the auditorium. Remember, our theme this year is Courageous Christians, and uh, our example this month of courage, which is our last month of examples. Next six months, we'll be talking about different ways to demonstrate courage as the Apostle Paul. So there's plenty you can read about Paul and the courage that he had all the time the time from his conversion to the time of his imprisonment. So um, keep that in mind. We're on week number 24 of our daily Bible reading. Keep that in mind as well. And uh, put your checks on the encouragement board. There's several on for this month. So um, add your invitations to that as well. Uh, there's also a report from Brother Larry Ping, who preaches for the uh, First City Congregation in Vincennes, Indiana. We help with his support, and that's on the bulletin board to your right as you leave. Uh, if you care to look at that, that's available. Group number two is scheduled to meet after services this evening. Nothing further. Let's all bow together and we'll be dismissed with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're very thankful for this Lord's Day that you've given us, for all the blessings it's brought. We pray that you would be with each and every one that is here this morning and be with our families and be with our friends and those we know of who are suffering from health issues at this time, uh, those who may be suffering losses in their families uh, and other challenges that would tax their faith. We pray that 
put your loving arms around them and give them the encouragement that they need and help us as their brethren do the same. We pray that you be with each and every one of us as we go about our daily walks of life, that we might be able to live faithful lives before you, that our faith might remain strong, and that we might set good examples that might lead others to Christ. Pray now that you would forgive us for our sins as we repent of them and bring us back again this evening as we come together to worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.